Well, I suppose we'll go ahead and um, start our program. Uh, as uh, there are still some folks that are joining us, but um, we'll go ahead and get this evening's presentation underway. So good evening, everyone. My name is Kari Love. I am the CEO of the Atlanta Women's Foundation. And I am thrilled to welcome you to tonight's presentation, Any Great Change, the Centennial of the 19th Amendment. This is presented tonight by our partner, the Atlanta History Center. As the only public foundation in the state of Georgia dedicated solely to women and girls, the Atlanta Women's Foundation's mission is to be a catalyst of change for the, in the lives of women and girls. We achieve this mission by serving as a convener, educator, and funder. Since our inception, AWF has invested over $18 million into the community for the economic advancement of women and girls. We've also trained thousands of women to be community and civic leaders. Tonight, as we gather to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, we also recognize the decades-long struggle for all women's suffrage, including the impact on Georgia's women. AWF is thrilled to partner with the Atlanta History Center for this educational webinar, and we thank the Georgia Power Foundation for making tonight's presentation possible. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Ventina Chisholm Terry, who is the Senior Vice President for Metro Atlanta and Corporate Relations for Georgia Power, who is also an AWF board member. Ventina? Thank you, Kari. As Kari stated, I'm Bentina Chisholm Terry, Senior Vice President of Metro Atlanta Region and Corporate Relations at Georgia Power. On behalf of the Georgia Power Foundation, we'd like to express our thanks to the Atlanta History Center and the Atlanta Women's Foundation for offering this special program in this virtual environment so everyone can enjoy it safely from your homes. As a female executive in the energy sector, I am personally aware of the perceptions women have faced in the corporate world as well as in our daily lives. However, we're making great strides, especially in the city of Atlanta, to elevate women as strong leaders in our community. I admire the impact that women in business, education, healthcare, and civil service have made on our city and look to leaders such as Mayor Keisha Lance Bottom, Stacey Abrams, Carol Tomei, former Mayor Shirley Franklin, Halla Maldemog, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, former U.S. Attorney General Sally Yates, Juanita Barranco, Dr. Bernice King, and our very own Kim Green, CEO of Southern Company Gas, just to name a few. And now to see the first woman of color named to a major party national ticket, Kamala Harris is continuing to make history for our country. While the fight is certainly not over at Georgia Power and at the Georgia Power Foundation, we will continue to invest in programming that supports females at each stage of life. We will continue the legacy of women of today and those that came before us. Again, the Georgia Power Foundation is proud to sponsor this wonderful collaboration between the Atlanta's Women Foundation and the Atlanta History Center. We also applaud the work of both of these organizations as they do all they can to educate and build up the next generation of women in our communities. I'd now like to turn it over to Sheffield Hale, President and CEO of the Atlanta History Center. Sheffield? Well, thank you, Bentina. Um, of course, the, you missed the most important thing is that you're a trustee of the Atlanta History Center. <laughs> so we're uh, grateful for that. And, um, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, and to welcome you on behalf of the History Center, and um, I hope you'll all come by. Um, and, you know, on this great anniversary of the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment for us to all be here talking about this, um, there's a lot for us to learn um, still. Uh, any great change must expect opposition. That's the 1853 quote by abolitionist and suffragettes, um, Lucretia Coffin Mott, that inspired the title of the exhibition. And there certainly was ex uh, opposition, and the rope right to vote was not granted to women, of course, until 1920. However, we know that that's not even a true indication of suffrage when that became universal. Women of color would have to continue to fight to have their right to vote equally recognized and respected. In particular, black women would have to wait until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 
to have the 19th Amendment fully applied to them. Inside any great change, there are timelines on two walls, from one across from each other. One chronicles the suffrage movement and the other voting rights. We um, further explore how the suffrage movement interacted with or didn't interact with the fight for civil rights and full citizenship and our full installation of the um, traveling exhibition, um, Black Citizenship in the Era of uh, Age of Jim Crow, which is on view, extended until March 21, 2021. So please come see it. Also, just for your information, soon to be on view is our new permanent exhibition, Atlanta 96, Shaping an Olympic and Paralympic City. This uh, exhibition introduced concepts about how we as residents can change the places we live a salient um, point in these difficult times. That exhibition will open up on September 18th, the 30th anniversary of the announcement that Atlanta had been selected to host the uh, Olympic Games. So please, please come. As always, there's more information about coming to Atlanta History Center. For better or for worse, we are the one, one of the most socially distant places on the planet. So you're safe at the Atlanta History Center. Please come. Um, now, I'll introduce uh, uh, the curator of Any Great Change, the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Jessica Van Landype is Atlanta History Center Vice President of Guest Experiences and the lead curator. Jessica holds a master's degree in heritage preservation with a concentration in public history from Georgia State University. In addition to her work at the History Center, she serves on the Historic Preservation Commi Committee of the City of Decatur and is chair of the Historic House Committee for the American Association of State and Local History. Like me, Jessica began her involvement with the Atlanta History Center as a volunteer many years ago and has continued to be a dedicated, knowledgeable, and passionate member of our senior staff. I will now hand things over to you, Jessica, and you can handle all the change. Thank you all very much um, for having me. Very good. Uh, thanks, Sheffield. Great introduction. I appreciate you being here to do this. Kari, I cannot thank you all enough, and Ventina at Georgia Power for making our, our suffrage uh, centennial commemoration dreams come true. Um, this is really kind of, uh, as we all are experiencing life uh, this summer in the ways that we are virtual and the ways that we can continue to connect with one another through our screens. Um, I'm happy to tell you along with Sheffield that the exhibition is open. So I hope that I'm not giving the exhibition away to you today. We want you to be able to come out to the History Center to see the exhibition, to see artifacts, to see the pieces from uh, the suffrage movement up, up until now. Uh, you know, we wanted to chronicle 100 years of, of what women have been doing with the vote uh, the activism that's continued to take place. And so I do hope that you'll come out and visit us, uh, including uh, the exhibition uh, Black Citizenship in the Age of Jim Crow, uh, which kind of dovetails nicely. It's a year and a huge election year in which we're talking about citizenship, in which we're talking about voting rights almost in our daily lives these days. So to be able to be here uh, and have this conversation with you, I'm so thankful. I'm going to share my screen at this point. And hope that you all can see nicely uh, the title panel for any great change, the centennial of the 19th Amendment. I um, wanted to just kind of talk with you a little bit at first before we get into the presentation about, uh, you know, a centennial or about the word, you know, commemoration. As, as we think about these huge events, we think about 100 years. And so we can look back and see what people did to get to this place and what we've done since then. Um, and the, the public history, the historian world, there's a, been a lot of discussion around the centennial of the 19th Amendment for years. Of course, there's excitement to get to this point in an election year to be able to discuss the work that men and women have done for equality and civil rights. But it's also, um, like we say at the History Center, history is messy. Um, and, and the fight for the 19th Amendment, like the fight for most voting rights, is, is messy. Um, and it's complicated. Um, and there's an alphabet soup uh, full of, of acronyms and their dates and their people doing great things and not so great things within the movement. And, and that's what defines us, right? That's what we experience when we look at history. We get to see and kind of pull apart the nuance. It's not black and white. Um, and so we use the word commemoration. We're looking at the work. We're looking and hoping to learn from what uh, suffragists and anti-suffragists did, uh, the strategies that they used, why they used and employed those strategies and what that means for us now, including the fact 
that in 1920, um, although the 19th Amendment guarantees um, the vote, um, uh, you know, discrimination based on sex, it doesn't really mean that women just can walk up to the ballot box, right? It's, it's much more complicated and nuanced than that. So the idea that we are, you know, kind of commemorating this time is, is for the exhibition. Um, we wanted to, to think about the work that was done up to the 19th Amendment and that ratification date that takes place August 18th, 1920, which is 100 years um, tomorrow. Um, but also what we've done since the vote, right, to look at the work that women have done through the activism, through the community organization, um, through running for office, through using our vote and the power that that vote guarantees to be able to make change. And that's what's really important about the people who showed up for the suffrage uh, for the 19th Amendment, the people that are, that are showing up for equal suffrage is they realize the power of the vote. They're not always there just for equality. They're not always there because they believe that based on gender, I should have the same rights as everyone else. That is a leading um, belief and that's a leading way that people are entering the movement, but they see the power of the vote as a means to an end. So they're coming in it for, for different reasons um, and, and, and hoping to leverage uh, the, uh, you know, voting rights, the vote for, for the, the, the next thing they want accomplished. And there are a variety of reasons and, and places around the country that women are coming in for uh, the, the opportunity to exercise that vote to gain that kind of power. So as, as Sheffield said, the, the um, title of the exhibition comes from a quote from Lucretia Coffin Mott, she's a convener of the um, Seneca Falls Convention, the first women's rights convention. Um, and I really loved the quote because when you're thinking about voting rights in general, the struggles that this country is, is um, you know, over since our founding, what we have been doing to secure equality and voting rights is it's all a change. Um, it's a change from the way that the founders envisioned it. It's a change from the ways that this land was operating before settlement. And so thinking about the, the movements that continue is you're setting the 19th Amendment within this larger kind of you know, voting rights struggles that this country um, has been fighting through. So it's just one in the very many <laughs> of our struggles. And that begins, the, the US Constitution is ratified in 1788, there are 10 amendments approved in the Bill of Rights. So citizenship's not even mentioned until we get to the 14th Amendment in 1868. So they really didn't define citizenship. And that's where the core of our voting rights comes from is our, our citizenship. It's part of the guarantee of citizenship. And so before then, voting rights are kind of coming and going based on the states or based on municipalities and the ways in which they want to give voting rights to individuals. Even with the 14th Amendment, not every citizen has the right to vote, which is suffrage. When we use the term suffrage, that's what we're talking about is the right to vote. Voting secures the key benefits of the democratic process. It secures your say. It allows you to have representatives who reflect yourself, reflect your own values, and it allows you to, to create laws that you know, help to ensure your own equality. The woman's suffrage movement resulted in the 19th Amendment. There's another amendment in there too, the 15th Amendment, which uh, ensures that the vote cannot be denied on the basis of race, which basically ensures that black men have the right to vote. However, we know that's part of the story of post reconstruction and the struggles that take place in creating barriers for black men to have the vote. And then even after the 19th Amendment to continue uh, barriers to the vote. What's really important is the, the ballot and, and, and why they've all taken up this fight, why we've been taking up the fight for voting rights since the very beginning um, is what I love so much. Atlanta suffragist Lugenia Burns Hope said, the ballot is, was, and is the safeguard of the nation. It is the thing that keeps us secure as the nation. Well, that's really important as we move to um, kind of what, what is that, what does voting rights mean for us? What is it as a citizen, why is it important for us? First of all, it's a right, uh, it's a responsibility, it's part of what makes our country what it is. Uh, it's part of what um, is, is ensured as we 
uh, decided <laughs> among citizenship that we wanted to um, use who we were as citizens to, to continue to move the franchise forward. In 18th century, voting qualifications were reserved primarily for property owning or tax paying white males over the age of 21. That's really basically only about 6% of the population. And that passage of the 15th Amendment eliminated race as a qualification for voting rights. And then again, that 19th Amendment comes in, but it again only ensures that some people have the right to vote. After receiving the right to vote, people continue to have to struggle and fight. We're looking at the, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 um, and even uh, edits to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that continue to give voting rights to uh, citizens. Now, these two quotes are two of my favorites that kind of helped, again, let us know why voting is so important. It's the application of democracy to women and that government of the people is but partially realized so long as women have no vote. Women are saying, you know, we're part of and just about half of the population of this country. Um, and it is our duty among all of the other ways that we are participating in citizens, that we are organizing as citizens, that we were showing up to support one another, that this is a way in which um, women should be recognized and should have that power. One of the really important things about the suffrage movement and, and something we don't often get to learn in our textbooks is that it's multicultural and that it happens across the country. When you think of the suffrage movement, you probably have a couple of different names in mind. You probably have Susan B. Anthony, you probably have Elizabeth Cady Stanton, maybe you've heard Sojourner Truth. Um, you know, these are people who, you know, kind of rank high up there um, and, and who did this work really wanted to kind of, uh, when you walk in the exhibition and when you read about the suffrage movement to see that a lot of people show up for different reasons, including women who know that even after the 19th Amendment has passed, that they still may not be able to take uh, full advantage of the vote. They still will have barriers in place uh, to, to um, have to continue to work for uh, 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 dismantling in order to gain the vote. Um, these six women are six women who worked in a variety of ways. Um, over on the very far left is Susan B. Anthony. Um, top center is Mary Louise Baldwin, Baldwin, an indigenous woman. To her right is I Ida B. Wells Barnett. Uh, lower left is Adelina Otero Warren. Uh, center is Adela Hunt Logan. And to the far right is Dr. Mabel Ping Coley. And these are women who showed up in a variety of ways and, and knew that the votes would be a vehicle in which to secure either further equality or other movements in which they believed in. And the women worked within the larger uh, organizations to some extent, but they also worked within their own communities and they formed their own organizations to ensure that women around them, that people around them uh, had access to the literature and information and how to be an active citizen, how to, uh, to you know, work for the vote um, in their own way. Adelina Otero Warren ensured that in the uh, American Southwest that suffrage pamphlets and materials were translated into Spanish. Uh, Dr. Lee was a Chinese immigrant who was in New York City uh, ensured that people in her community, the Chinese immigrant community, were showing up and were advocating even though Chinese immigrants were not considered citizens at this point. Uh, Dr. Uh, excuse me, Ida B. Wells Barnett uh, is fighting for racial equality, anti-lynching movement, and also starts a suffrage club because again, these women are understa understanding the mobilization uh, and the uh, opportunities the vote offers to continue to do that work that's so important to them. This is also where we get into, and I get a little bit tongue-tied in the alphabet soup of the women's suffrage movement. I, I, um, there are a lot of different organizations that are doing work in different ways, and, and primarily um, what happens is women are, are flocking to organizations that kind of meet the, um, their values or beliefs or the ways in which the strategies, strategies in which they believe can help achieve the vote. So kind of going back to the very beginning, um, the Women's Rights Convention is held in Seneca Falls in 1848. Lucretia Mott, Elizabeth Cady Stanton are the conveners. 
of the first women's rights convention. And so they brought all of these folks to Seneca Falls and they had these days worth of speeches around why uh, women should have equal rights. And they created the Declaration of Sen Sentiments and Grievances, which was meant to kind of parallel the Declaration of Independence. And it actually starts out with the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And this is one of the first places that women officially are looking to the franchise, they're looking to uh, ensure equality through the vote. And so this movement, this kind of 1848 Seneca Falls, their women's rights conventions after that, that continue to grow. And these women kind of tend to flock to places that um, they believe can provide the vote and provide the work that they need going forward. This is where things get um, kind of tricky because their first uh, uh, organization that's formed is the American Equal Rights Association. Um, and it forms after one of these uh, women's rights conventions. And the idea is that now you've kind of created a group that will move forward and they will kind of lobby together and organize around the country to do the work of gaining the suffrage or gaining uh, the vote. Um, but this is where um, we see splits in the movement over race. And this is one of the, the parts of the movement uh, in which we, we um, see that women are, and men are looking for places um, through, the, through the vote or through power that can allow them um, to ensure um, that they, they can lobby on their behalf. And this is where we get um, uh, white supremacy and the racism within the uh, 19th Amendment. And this is part of the um, story in which these uh, organizations begin to split and begin to kind of move around over the 15th Amendment. So the 15th Amendment comes up and it is there to um, ensure that uh, Black men have uh, the right to vote. Um, but uh, Susan B. Anthony um, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton believe that uh, it will impede women from getting the right to vote. And so they're going to split off and form other another organization. And these organizations continue to split and, and, and move back and forth together um, based on the 15th Amendment. So there's the National Women's Suffrage Association, which does not believe in the 15th Amendment, and the American Women's Suffrage Association, which does believe in the 15th Amendment. And that's Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell. They're going to come together after the passage of the 15th Amendment, the National Women's Suffrage, uh, Women's Suffrage Association, these two groups come back together and they're fighting throughout the states. They're fighting for a constitutional amendment and they're fighting to ensure this equality. Uh, one of the later parties is the National Women's Party. Uh, that's Alice Paul and she's coming up in the early 20th century. Uh, and she and her party are much more radical than these other parties. I mean, kind of talk about this alphabet soup a little bit and the ways that these change, but the important piece of this is that there, the variety of strategies um, is, is uh, in place, uh, are, are put in place because they want to, um, they want to organize in the best possible way. They want to organize in a way that they think will bring power to them. And oftentimes this is where we see um, the, the racial uh, inequalities and the white supremacy within the 19th Amendment and beliefs that um, by giving white women the vote that you can um, it's, yeah, ensure that their white supremacy uh, continues in the southeast and continues around the country. And there's some discussion on whether or not all of these strategies are effective in that way, but it is certainly a blemish on the 19th uh, Amendment and the work that these women are doing and shows kind of the, the work that they're trying to figure out as they're moving forward in the ways that they can ensure um, equality. So these are some of the Georgian women um, and they are coming in again for a variety of ways. Um, in a variety of means. At the very bottom left is Helen Augusta Howard. She founded the Georgia Women's Suffrage Association, which is the first women's suffrage association in the state of Georgia, and that was formed uh, in the late 19th century. She actually wrote a letter um, to the leaders of the National American Suffrage Women, Women's Suffrage Association and brought um, the first time that they had their convention outside of Washington, D.C., they had it in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, brought those women here. Um, and it was quite exciting for the women who were suffragists 
um, to be involved in this and to participate. Um, there is a lot of opposition to suffrage in Georgia. Um, there are in fact more uh, anti-suffragists in the state of Georgia than suffragists. Um, and this is something that women will have to continue to kind of fight against, but the excitement over kind of the, the first uh, suffrage association in Georgia, that continues to grow and we'll see suffrage organizations in, in both uh, kind of the cities of Georgia um, and the rural areas. We'll see support in a variety of types of ways around the country. Um, in the top right corner is the neighborhood union that was founded by Virginia Burns Hope. The new neighborhood work, uh, union did work in Atlanta um, for a, ver a variety of causes, including um, racial equality, um, access to education, women's suffrage. Um, there's the Georgia Young People Suffrage Association to the left. They show up in Atlanta's first parade and they'll end up going to the national parade um, in Washington, D.C. Um, in the center bottom is Mary McCurdy Candler. She was um, a, a reporter in North Georgia and spoke uh, about suffrage in North Georgia. And then to the far right is uh, Emily McDougald. Uh, Emily McDougald was a suffragist in Atlanta and started the Equal Suffrage Party of Georgia. Uh, uh, Emily McDougald uh, was originally from Columbus, Georgia and moved her family to Atlanta and there she's involved in a variety of kind of political causes, but uh, she and uh, colleagues start the Equal Suffrage Party, Party of Georgia, which becomes one of the largest and most parties in the state. Um, they are partly uh, working with um, you know, the various kind of men and women in the state to pass out suffrage leaflets. They have suffrage schools that they offer. They teach people how to mobilize and talk about suffrage uh, with their peers. Um, they also employ what is considered the Southern strategy as they're using white supremacy as um, one of their arguments to try to move um, suffrage forward in the South um, and, 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 and using the argument that if white women are voting, that that might help the numbers and like continue white supremacy in the Southeast. This is uh, Emily Inman, uh, Emily McDougald, uh, its daughter. Uh, she is the owner of Swan House and Swan House is where um, the uh, uh, Any Great Change, the exhibition is placed. Uh, Emily was a suffragist alongside her mother. She rode in Atlanta's first women's suffrage parade um, and participate in some of the leaflet, leafleting uh, that took place there in Georgia. So we get to the 19th Amendment and we talk about what is, you know, kind of the, the last few years of, of um, the, the, the moving to the 19th Amendment. Um, in 1918, President Wilson endorsed the suffrage amendment. Um, this was in large part because one, the ticket, uh, picketing that took place, um, that is the top picture is the silent sentinels, the National Women's Party organized women from around the country to come picket the White House. And that's the first group of people to ever picket um, the White House is the suffrage, uh, the suffragettes. Um, so he's got them outside his front gates every day picketing, but it's also World War I as women are involved in a variety of ways during World War I. Um, and uh, Wilson kind of recognizes the work that they had done. And that kind of is the last thing that convinces him that he should support the 19th Amendment. There's actually a special session of Congress. The House voted for the amendment in May of 1919 and the all-male Senate passed it June 4th, 1919. The only Southern supporter of the suffrage movement or of the 19th Amendment is Senator William J. Harris of Georgia. Um, we're not quite sure why he supported it, but he did and was the only Southern Senator to support it. The 19th Amendment is then ratified on August 18th of 1920. It's actually Tennessee um, became the 36th, uh, 36th state to pass the amendment. Harry Byrne cast the deciding vote quite literally because his mother told him to. She wrote him a letter that basically said, you need to do this to ensure that women have the vote. Uh, and so that is the ratification and the uh, amendment uh, becomes official the very next week of 1920. And Georgia has quite an, um, a, a, a unique, um, I would say, a relationship with the 19th Amendment. 
um, even though our, our, the only Southern supporter of the amendment is from Georgia, the state itself becomes the first to reject ratification. We actually rejected the 19th Amendment first in July um, of 1919, and we don't, uh, we don't ratify the 19th Amendment until 1970, and that's largely a symbolic vote. The Equal Rights Amendment is being discussed in the United States Congress at this point. Many Southern states will ratify the 19th Amendment um, in the 1970, 1971, 1972, a symbolic uh, kind of support of, of women's equality. So we get the 19th Amendment um, and that ensures that uh, women cannot be, um, women have access to the vote, but it doesn't mean that there are no barriers to the vote for women. And this is the fight that continues, the movement continues, the movement for voting rights continues. That work has to move on and it moves on through a variety of ways. Um, one in which uh, is that many of the women who, who advocated, who were suffragists, who showed up for the vote are not guaranteed the vote for a variety of reasons, including um, their, their status um, as citizens of the United States. It's not until 1924 that Native Americans are made citizens of the United States and not until 1943 that Asian Americans are given citizenship. So some of the women that we've talked about that did that work that knew that even with the passage of the 19th Amendment that they would still have work to do to gain the vote. And then the civil rights movement uh, will work to ensure uh, the Voting Rights Act. Um, on the right is one of my favorite um, civil rights activist, that's Amelia Boynton Robinson. She's from Savannah, Georgia. Uh, she's a civil rights act activist in Alabama, becomes the first uh, African-American woman to run for a, a, a seat in Alabama. Um, she was there on Bloody Sunday at the Edmund Pettus Bridge uh, with John Lewis um, and was beaten and tear gassed on that day. And she continued her work um, for many years to come. And this is the work that, that had to continue because as the voting rights, the 15th Amendment, uh, 19th Amendment, um, puts into place the things that give us um, the ability to go vote, the states have the power to decide the ways in which we do vote. And so through the poll taxes and the literacy tests and immigration status, the states were deciding how people had access to the vote. And so that 1965 Voting Rights Act is the thing that helps to break down many of those barriers to allow access to the vote. And that's an important part of the discussion and the fact that we're setting this in this larger context of voting rights and the fact that this is something that people have been working for and towards for a very long time. And you're breaking down barriers to the vote, vote that that must continue um, as the you know, past the 19th Amendment as the next 100 years goes on. So what have we done since then? And that's the really kind of important thing to consider today is what we've done with the vote and what we will continue to do with the vote. Um, we wanted to kind of document and look at some of the women who we consider our firsts in the state to think about the ways in which women were, were organizing so by 1980, 60 years after the passage of the 19th Amendment, voter turnout was equal that of men, but it grew steadily. So this is really important. Since 1980, voter turnout among women has equaled or exceeded men. So we're showing up in greater numbers. We have the power to continue to make change with that vote. The number of women running uh, has grown as well, including the 2018 midterm elections, which is the largest class of women to Congress in our nation's history, and includes more firsts, such as the first Native American and Muslim women to be elected to Congress. So that's on uh, the, the uh, you know, idea of, of running and being elected. Um, we also have the opportunity for women to organize, to participate uh, in a variety of ways, and that's what we think about with citizenship is the ways that which we can show up, the ways in which we can participate to make the, you know, just our small little bubble around us or to run um, and to create change on a larger perspective. These three photos are three of my favorite kind of first women in the state of Georgia. The top left is Leah Ward Sears. She was the first woman appointed to the Supreme Court of Georgia and the first woman, woman to win a contested statewide election in Georgia. And 13 years later, she was sworn in as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Georgia. Uh, to her right 
is Helen Douglas Mencken. She was the first woman elected to Congress in Georgia. Uh, while in office, she supported reforms and supported the abolition of the poll tax. And below her is Grace Towns Hamilton, the first African-American woman elected to the Georgia General Assembly. She was an effective legislator who expanded representation for Black Georgians in, the, uh, in local government. And these are the ways in which we uh, women have done the work in the last hundred years and the ways in which we continue to go forward. There are a variety of ways that you can participate as a system, as a citizen. Voting rights are not the only way, but it is an important way to gain that power. You can register to vote. You can ensure that you understand who you're, who's running in, in your local elections. You can inform yourself as a voter. You can show up as a community participant um, to town hall meetings. You can call your Congress people. There are a variety of ways in which we can continue to show up um, and to, to honor the work that was done uh, by these women. So I wanna thank you all for having me today. Um, again, we hope you'll come out to the Atlanta History Center, view the exhibition. It's at Swan House uh, at the History Center. Um, and it takes you through um, the voting rights timelines, both for this country and as well as the 19th Amendment. So thank you so much. We're actually now going to take some um, questions from our audience and um, get my, there we go. <laughs> um, I have a few questions from the audience. So um, this one's um, from Beth Shapiro and her question is related to um, the ratification of the 19th Amendment here in Georgia. And you mentioned 1970. 50 years later. Um, she wanted to know if you have um, information or thoughts around, you know, who or what motivated the legislator uh, to finally ratify that amend amendment. It's, it's really um, part of the, the symbolism of it more than the, the, the fact that it does anything with Tennessee's ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, Technically, um, Georgia women could vote, although it was two years later that um, Georgia women actually participated in their first election in 1922. By 1970, it, it means nothing at this point. It's been ratified, but a lot of Southern states around the discussions of the Equal Rights Amendment that was coming up at this point, um, and Southern states saw an opportunity to um, perhaps ratify the 19th Amendment to um, demonstrate that they believed that women, demonstrate uh, their belief in women's equality. Um, this is the first time that um, I've ever had to update an exhibition with the recent um, ratification, additional states ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, it's going to go to the courts and it's going to be kind of confusing as we decide what that looks like going forward. Um, but we, we actually have a panel and discuss the Equal Rights Amendment, what that means for Georgia, um, and what that would mean for women. So we'll be um, anticipate to see what, what, what happens with that. Interesting, yeah. Um, just wanted to mention to any of our attendees, if you wanted to submit a question, um, just use your question and answer box um, and we'll go ahead and take, um, take those questions. So here, another question um, that came in was, and you mentioned this about Helen Augusta Howard establishing the, um, the Georgia Women's Suffrage Association. Um, so with so many Georgians, and you, you alluded to this, being so divided that there were some that were, some women, well, and not women, but the, that Georgia was so divided um, that there were probably more anti-suffragists um, than there were suffragists. Um, what, do you have any sense of what the public perception and perhaps in the news, what the coverage was like about, about that? Right, yeah, it's, it, it's a big deal, right? You have these kind of national names coming to, to Georgia, and this was a big deal for it to be even be outside of Washington, D.C. in the first place. When it comes to the state of Georgia, it comes to the South, it comes to a place where opposition is so strong, um, and that's part of the, you know, um, just the papers kind of looking at it is, you know, wow, these national names have come here, they've brought all of these people here, they're kind of um, rallying women around this cause, and the in the South, 
um, but it's also at the same time, there are plenty of opposition groups around the nation, including the Georgia Association opposed to women's suffrage. Um, and, and these kinds of groups, you know, believe in a variety of ways, the reasons that women should not have the vote. And, and that's certainly uh, around the South, that's, uh, you know, more prevalent and much more the domineering belief is that uh, women should not um, have access to the vote for a variety of reasons. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's exciting, but it doesn't really change the tide of, of you know, the, the overall feelings of, of support for suffrage in, in Georgia. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's um, so much work still to be done. Um, the next question is, can you talk about how the women's suffrage organization's activism shifted following the passage of the 19th Amendment? Did they dissolve or did they take up new causes existing infrastructure? Well, it's actually the Equal Rights Amendment that, that is the first thing to kind of come up after the 19th Amendment um, is women said, okay, well, now we've got, you know, the vote at this point, we've got this idea of equal franchise, what other equality should we work towards? And so the Equal Rights Amendment comes up in like 1922, 1923, almost immediately. There's also the fact that women now have the vote and need to figure out what to do with it. And so there are organizations that are formed. Uh, Emily McDougall, the Equal Suffrage Party of Georgia, um, actually they started um, the League of Women Voters of Georgia right after that. And the idea is to educate women on the vote, to continue to register, to register women to vote, to continue um, helping people understand the power of the vote. And so those kind of organizations will begin to pop up around the country. Um, so the next question um, is around um, where, where does Georgia rank now in percent of elected officials who are women in legislature or as mayors or in Congress? Do you have a, a sense of that? That's a great question. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. No, no problem. Um, okay. So, will say that I think that um, Georgia, uh, that women are, I think, 50% of, 53% of Georgia's electorate. So there are over half of us uh, in the state who have voting power. So that's pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you know what would have been the reason for the split concerning the 15th Amendment? Do you have any? Yeah, so, so the, you know, these women kind of get together in 1848, and, and many of them come from the abolition or anti-slavery movements, um, and, and they're kind of coming in and, and wanting to uh, advocate for what they believe in next, and the, the 15th Amendment um, is Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton believe that um, it would split the support for the women's suffrage and movement. Um, so it's not necessarily that they didn't believe that black men should have equal franchise, but they believed it would take the power or the focus away from women's suffrage. And, and Susan B. Anthony's pretty outspoken around this. And so they split because there are groups of people who say, no, if we're gonna do equal suffrage, we should do it in this way. We should support it for black men, for, for women. Um, and then their groups are saying, we're just here showing up for women. And if this other thing happens, that's great too. Um, and, and so it's kind of this strategy of the movement is how do you think that you can gain the most power and to get the most people on your side? Um, and the groups will come back together after the passage of the 15th Amendment, not that they put their differences aside or not that their beliefs have changed, but they're kind of remobilizing around the 19th Amendment at that point. Um, the next question is related to the exhibit. And so um, the, the question is, how long will the exhibit be available and is it currently open? It is currently open, I'm happy to say that. Um, and it will be open through 2021. It was originally uh, slated to close at the, end, uh, excuse me, at the beginning of 21, um, but due to the shutdown, uh, we wanted to give everybody fair opportunity to see it. So you've got through next year. So um, are there issues today that still need to be addressed regarding women's suffrage? And what can um, our, our audience and what can we do as a community um, to help and to continue to be educated? You know, there are a variety of groups and, and, and ways in which you can support. And 
Um, when you think about um, voting rights access over time, you're looking at breaking down barriers to the vote. Um, and you can look at your daily news uh, and see that there are barriers popping up all over the place and choose the ways in which you wanted to fight to break down those barriers. You can also educate yourself, educate those around you, help to understand you know, the power of the vote, the ways in which you vote. And certainly this year, um, as, we, as we figure out you know, absentee voting and, and you know, elections coming up, um, is to educate yourself. And there are certainly organizations in which um, they create voter guides for you that help you understand and break down issues so you can choose um, based on the issue, um, the ways in which you want to vote. Um, and, 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 you know, one of the things that I think Florida last year um, gave voting rights to people who had been previously convicted of a crime. And this is another barrier, another way in which the vote has been restricted by, um, restricted to people is, is there are 50 states and something like 40 of them have different uh, laws that restrict voting rights if you've been convicted of a crime and this takes away your franchise. And so there's work to be done to break down those laws uh, and to repeal those laws as well. Great, um, great to, information to have. So um, thank you for those suggestions and recommendations. Well, I um, think based on our, on our time, we will go ahead and, and conclude our evening um, and this session. Jessica, thank you so much for your time and sharing with us um, your knowledge. Um, and uh, we just appreciate so much the partnership. And again, we want to extend our thanks to the Georgia Power Foundation for making this possible. Um, and we just appreciate everyone who has joined us tonight. Um, we will continue these kinds of important conversations um, around, um, around women and around um, equality. And so stay tuned, everyone. And uh, again, thank you so much, everyone. And we will say good night. So thank you very much.